It's believed Ephesus, being a great missionary church, evangelized these other six cities. You don't read about them uh, in the book of Acts, but Ephesus reached out and planted churches in these other areas. So Ephesus is kind of the mother church of that area and these other churches. So there in present-day Turkey, across is Greece. You know where Greece came from? It oozed out of Turkey. <laughs> if Brother Wood was up here, he could give me a drum roll real quick. <laughs> now, the church at Ephesus was founded by Paul. Read Acts chapter 19, and you can read about that. And uh, he was pastor there for about three years. And later on, Timothy pastored the church. And it's believed that late in his life, the Apostle John pastored the church at Ephesus. So they had some great pastors, amen? And uh, good men of God to lead them. We notice in the last part of chapter 1, John's vision of the Lord Jesus, and he sees him with seven stars in his hand, and there are seven golden candlesticks surrounding him. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and he writes to the angel of the church of Ephesus. By the way, the angel is who? I forget. Oh, yeah, the pastor. Okay. That blesses me. Would you stand with me as we honor God's word? We're going to read the first seven verses, and we'll look at the other section later on. This is the letter Jesus sent to the church of Ephesus. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, which represented the churches. He said, I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience. Now thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and found them liars, and hast borne and hast patience, for my name's sake hast labored and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, thou Hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcomes will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Amen. You may be seated. So Jesus is among these seven churches observing. You know, in the Old Testament, the high priest would enter into the holy place and he would trim the seven-branch lampstand. Well, Jesus is our high priest, amen? And he is among these lampstands, these churches, to observe them and to encourage them. Nothing is hid from his sight. Amen. So Ephesus would be the first of the seven churches. We'll call this the formal church. The formal church. First, he, talk, he talks about the faithful works of this church. By the way, if you look in your program, there's an outline if you want to follow that along and, and fill in the blanks. It might help you remember the message better. But he, he talks about the faithful works of this church. He said they were fervent in service. He commends them for thy labor. This was a church that was busy working for the Lord. They, they didn't just come together on the first day of the week. They worked for the Lord every day of the week. They had been taught by Paul, who founded this church, that they were saved by grace through faith unto good works. And we're not saved by good works, but we're saved unto good works. That should be the fruit of our life. So this was not a lazy church. They were not lily Christians. You know what a lily Christian is? They neither toil nor spin. But they don't. Come on, I'll wake up. This is not a lazy church. This is not a sleepy church where people come in praying, Lord, now lay me down to sleep. 
This was a working church. They were fervent in their service. And secondly, they were faithful in suffering. He praised them for their patience or for their endurance. They were suffering a lot of persecution. Ephesus was the great center of worship for the goddess Diana. And they were persecuted by these pagans. Now, folks, listen. We need a faith that will endure in these last dark days before Christ comes. No, you can tell the size of a person's faith by what it takes to make them quit. What would it take to make you quit? A little persecution, maybe. I talked to you and said, well, I used to go to church. I used to teach a class. I used to sing in a choir. Used to. That means they don't do it anymore. They quit. They quit. Don't quit. Don't quit. The Bible says Galatians 6, 9, In due season we shall reap if we faint not. If we don't quit, we'll reap a harvest. So the Ephesian church was a great church. A very, just a church that had a lot going on. They were reaching out to all these other cities and planting new churches. Doing a great work. They were firm in separation. He said, you cannot bear certain things. You, you hate the deeds of false teachers. You cannot abide false doctrine like Nicolaitanism. Nicolaitanism. Do we have any trouble with that? You know what that's about? Nikes. Any of you got Nike shoes? You know, Nike was a pagan god. He was a conquering god. Laity? What's laity? That's the people. We talk about the clergy and the laity, right? The laity, that's you. You're the laity. You're the people. Nike laity, conquering the people. This is talking about preacher rule. It's talking about a hierarchy in certain churches. God didn't call me to be a cowboy to drive the herd. He called me to be a shepherd to lead the flock. There's a lot of cowboy preachers. There's a lot of denominations that had this ecclesiastical hierarchy that rules over the people. The Bible says we're not the Lord over God's people, right? And it says God hates that, by the way. God hates that. Nicolaitanism. And we should not allow it in our congregations. Paul said in Ephesians 5, 11, Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. He said that to the Ephesian church. They remembered that. So he praised them for their faithfulness. Can God praise us here at Florence Street for our faithfulness? Are we faithful in service? Are we faithful in suffering and separation? Now, folks, this Ephesian church, this was a sound, orthodox, diligent, discerning church. But there was something lacking. Secondly, you see the fatal weakness of this church. Jesus says, there is something I cannot commend you for. I've, I've found something against you because you've left your first love. You left your first love. The vitality of their passion for Christ was gone. First love, what is that? I think it's kind of like that honeymoon love that newlyweds have. You know, each church is a spouse to Jesus Christ. We're going to read about a great church wedding in heaven when we get to Revelation 19. We're a spouse to Christ and one day he's going to come for us and take us back to the big wedding feast. And we're to be faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. You married folks, do you remember your courtship days? You remember that first love? How you just hated to be apart and you had that whoopsie doopsie, gushy gushy kind of love. 
You forgot all about that, haven't you? Now, your love for one another may be deeper than it was then. It may be stronger, more mature. But don't you sometimes miss that first love? The romance has kind of cooled off. If I, it doesn't say that they don't love the Lord anymore. It really doesn't say that they love him less than they did before. But the passion was gone. What used to excite them doesn't excite them anymore. What they used to rejoice in. Jesus misses that. That first love. That the new convert has when he comes to Christ. The vitality of their passion was gone. The validity of their profession was gone. Thou art fallen. Paul said to Ephesians, Ephesians 6, 24, Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus in sincerity. An undying love. Now I thought about this. This church receives this letter. The pastor stands up one Sunday and reads this to his congregation. Church in Ephesus. They like to hear it. Jesus is commending them about their labor of love. But then they hear him say, but I have this against you. You've left your first love. How do you think they felt when they heard that? I don't think they saw it. They were busy doing a lot of things. They did not see that that had happened to them. Maybe even the pastor had not seen it. But Jesus did. And it grieved him that this church had left their first love. Would he say that about us today? Has our passion cooled off somewhat? The excitement is gone. Do we need a revival of that first love? Then a third, there's a forceful warning to this church. He first commands them, then he condemns them, then he commands them. He gives them the three R's for revival. Remember. He said, remember from whence thou art fallen. Recall, reflect on the former days, how it used to be. You ever find yourself wanting to recapture something that's been lost in your spiritual life? Sometimes we need to stop and remember. Then he says, repent. Remember and repent. Has something come between you and God? Are there things that's taken priority in your life? And you don't really have the passion for Christ that you once had? Remember how it used to be. Repent if you have fallen away from that. Because anything you put before Christ, folks, is idolatry. I mean, let's just be honest. Whatever you put before Christ has become an idol in your life. Some of you are flirting with idolatry right now. Repent. Ask God to forgive you for that. Then return. It's the three R's. Remember, repent, return. And do the first work. Or else. You see that? Jesus said, or else I will come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick. What's the candlestick? It's the church itself. How does he remove a church? He ceases to bless it. He ceases to recognize it as one of his churches. You know, some churches, have seen, they still meet, but they're no longer a church in God's eyes. We've seen a lot of churches go out of existence. A lot of churches are just a, a shadow of what they once were. You've heard of Charles Haddon Spurgeon, right? Great preacher in, in England. He pastored the Metropolitan Baptist Tabernacle in London. In the late 1800s, it was the largest church in England. They would fill it up every, mor every Sunday morning, every Sunday night. It was packed. If you go over today and visit the Metropolitan Tabernacle, 
just a handful of people meeting in that great big building. Just a few people. It's just a memorial now of what it used to be. Folks, not everything that calls itself a church is recognized by God as a church. Amen. Many have, they they still meet, but they've gotten so far away from God's word and true doctrine that they've ceased to be a New Testament church. That's what happened to Ephesus. History tells us that the Ephesian church, after they received this letter, rallied to some extent and uh, became a stronger church. Later it lapsed again, and by the Middle Ages, uh, it didn't exist. It ceased to exist. Matter of fact, all these churches ceased to exist, all seven. One traveler said visiting Ephesus in the Middle Ages, he said, I found only three Christians there. And they had sucked in such ignorance and apathy, they didn't even know who Paul and Peter were. That's pretty bad, isn't it? Of course, Turkey today is a Muslim country. But it used to be a hotbed of Christianity back in the first, second century. It was lost. Go back to your text. Let's read verses 8 through 11. Let's think about another church that Jesus wrote to. Verse 8 says, Unto the angel of the church in Smyrna, he said, Write these things, saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. How they blaspheme these Christians. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that you may be tried, tested. And you shall have tribulation ten days. So I think that's referring to ten periods of persecution. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcomes shall not be hurt of the second death. So the second church is the church in Smyrna. Are really no complaint here, is there, about this church? It's a, it's a letter of encouragement to a suffering church. We're not sure where this church began, who started it. This is the only time it's mentioned in the scriptures. History tells us that Polycarp, a well-known name in church history, once pastored this church. And at the age of 86, he was martyred for his faith and this church was truly a church of martyrs history says at one time 1500 saints in Smyrna were put to death by their enemies so first of all think about the tribulation of this church the name Smyrna means bitter it comes from the word myrrh which speaks of the perfume that comes from myrrh being crushed It kind of described the crushing existence that they were going through. They were always under attack, always being persecuted. You think about the conditions of tribulation, the persecution that they endured. Their property was taken. Their citizenship was revoked. Many were cast into jail because of their faith in Christ. They couldn't get a job. All the trade unions were run by pagans. If you didn't have a card, you could not work. So it it was a time and place of great persecution. It was the center of emperor worship. We said Ephesus had the great temple of Diana. Smyrna had a great temple to the Roman Caesar. And once a year, the citizens of the Roman Empire were expected to go to the altar of Caesar, burn incense, and say, Caesar is Lord. You'd get a card saying that you'd done that. The Christians would not do it. They say, no, Christ is Lord. Caesar's not our Lord. Jesus Christ is our Lord. 
And because of this, they suffered great persecution. Because they would not worship at the shrine of Caesar. Now, folks, we don't face that kind of tribulation today. But you know what we may in the future? You know what they found out how easy it is to shut down churches? When you look back on it, boy, that was easy. Every church in America was shut down. They know how to do it now. What's going to come later? What, what, what's the future hold for American churches? Folks, you might better set yourself to face some persecution. If you're going to stand for the Lord Jesus Christ and be true to him, you're probably going to get persecuted in America. There's a lot of things going in that direction. We just need to pray that God will give us the strength and the courage to take a stand. People today don't want persecution. A lot of people, I think even a lot of preachers, they just want to get along with everybody. Even the devil, they want to get along with them too. Make a few concessions. Appease the ones in authority to avoid persecution. See, people today, what they really want to know is, how can I use Jesus to prosper? That's what they want to know. Preacher, tell me how I can use God to prosper. That's not what we're about. We don't make God our servant, a genie in a bottle. We're his servant. We're here to serve him. You see, the consequences of tribulation, they were, speaks of their poverty. Because of their faith in Christ, they just lost everything. It cost them dearly to follow Jesus. Now, folks, let's, let's admit, right now, it doesn't really cost us a whole lot to be a Christian in America. Amen? And you know what? It, it's not easy to interest a well-fed, well-dressed, affluent Sunday crowd today in America with this Smyrna brand of Christianity. The preacher, we don't want to hear about that. We don't want to deal with that. Hey, you better get ready to suffer for the cause of Christ, because I think it's coming. If the Lord delays his coming for the rapture, we're going to be seeing some of this. We're going to have to deal with it. We need to be ready. We may sing about the reproach of Christ. Then we go home to a big dinner, a game on TV, and a long nap. That's present-day American Christianity. And think of the cause of tribulation. Talking about the blasphemy or slander. They slandered these Christians. They called them cannibals because... They ate the Lord's body and drank his blood in the Lord's Supper. They misconstrued that. And the Christians would have their love feast. Uh, their enemies would say, well, they're having orgies of lust. They slandered them. Do we get slandered today? Those of us who are fundamental Baptists, who believe that this is the very word of God, can we get slandered? Sure we do. We're held up to ridicule. That's okay. Jesus suffered the same thing. The Jews in Smyrna greatly persecuted the Christians. He talks about the synagogue of the Jews. He says something interesting here. That they are Jews which say they are Jews and are not. But they're the synagogue of Satan. I thought about that. They say they're Jews, but they're not. I think what he means by that is these are not the true children of Abraham. They have rejected their Messiah. They are not my people of the covenant because of it. They say they're Jews, but their synagogue is a synagogue of Satan. That's pretty pretty strong talk, isn't it? I thought about that. You know, a lot of Jews today 
The main reason they are reluctant to come to Christ and be saved is because of the way Christians have treated them. Now, I'm saying Christians in a very loose form here. Basically, the Catholic Church, the Inquisition, all of that. Many Jews were put to death by Christians. Well, think about this. These Jews who said they were Jews but were not, well, there's Christians that say they're Christians and are not. And they bring a lot of slander upon Christ and his church. If you hate the Jews, you don't know your Bible. We are to love and support and pray for the Jews. But we'll suffer persecution. 2 Timothy 3, 12 says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 11, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you. And say all men are of evil against you falsely for my sake. Now note two requirements there. To be blessed, that they speak evil against you falsely. It's not true what they're saying. And that you're suffering for the sake of Jesus Christ. Those two requirements. Sadly, some Christians suffer because it's true. They are not living the Christian life. And the slander is not so much slander as it is the truth about some who profess to be Christians. Much to our shame. Then we should notice the treasure of this church. In spite of their poverty, Jesus said, Thou art rich. Because their thoughts were in another world, their riches lay in a different set of values. They followed Paul's admonition in Colossians 3, 1 and 2. If you be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, not on things in the earth. The Samaritan church was just the opposite of another church we're going to see later, the Laodicean church. The Laodicean church was rich materially and poor spiritually. While the Samaritan church was poor materially, but rich spiritually. Which would you rather be true of us? Their thoughts were in the next life because their treasures were laid up in the next life. They were laying up treasure in heaven. Let me ask you, where's most of your treasure? Is it here on earth? Or is it being laid up in heaven? Jesus said in Luke 2, 12, 15, that a man's life consists not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. It might be a revelation to some of you. Life is more than that. The Smyrna saints were investing in heavenly riches. And so should we. Then finally, note the triumph of this church. Be thou faithful unto death. More persecution is going to be coming their way. He says, just be faithful, be true, even unto death. They suffered much martyrdom. And throughout the church age, millions of believers have been martyred because of their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, touch more. I don't want to be standing behind these Smyrna martyrs on the day of judgment. Then we're going to face the judgment seat of Christ, and our lives are going to be examined whether or not we can be rewarded. I don't want to be standing behind a Smyrna martyr and after his life is examined and how he gave his life, then I have to stand there. I want to get behind some of you. <laughs> You're thinking, well, preacher, I just think I'd like to get behind you. Well, <laughs> it might be good too. But we're going to stand before the Lord one day. And we're going to have to answer. Did we avoid persecution? Receive a crown of life. That's a victor's crown, a Stephanos. This was given in the athletic games to the victorious athletes. They would get that crown. Jesus is saying, just keep on keeping on because it's going to be worth it one day. What you do for Christ. 
Many of these Smyrna saints did not escape the death of martyrs. But they were delivered from the second death. The Bible talks about a second death, doesn't it? Now here's the thing. Born once, die twice. Born twice, die once. If at all. Because some are going to get raptured and not see death at all, will they? You understand what I'm saying? You must be born again. Born twice. If you're born twice, you won't suffer the second death. But if you're not born again and you die with your sins, you will suffer two deaths. A physical death and a spiritual death. But it's not God's will that you perish. Did you know that? It's not God's will that any of you perish but have eternal life. Brother Sam, would you come? We're going to prepare for this hymn of invitation. As we prepare to sing this closing hymn, we have an invitation. You know, I pray God will help us as we go through these letters that we will be honest with ourselves and examining ourselves that we'll understand that no matter what we have to do or, or experience for the Lord Jesus Christ, it will be worth it all. Amen? It'll be worth it all. But let me ask you, have you been born again? Have you been born again? Jesus once said in Matthew 10, 28, Fear not him who can kill the body, those who were making martyrs, these Christians, don't fear them. Rather fear him who can kill both body and soul. Fear him. So, child of God, we may have to suffer. We may be called on to suffer. But let's rejoice in suffering. We can re suffer for the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're lost, lost friend, as I say, there's something to fear more than what man can do to you. You should fear losing your eternal soul. Do you have assurance that you're going to heaven? If you should die today, do you have assurance that you would go to heaven? Do you? Do you know what a person needs to do in order to go to heaven? But obviously, you need to repent of your sin and put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. He died on the cross to pay your sin debt. Trust in him today. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. So, Brother West, I'm still not sure. Tell you what, during this invitation, you come forward. We'll have people up here ready. We can take you aside and, and talk to you and answer your questions and pray with you. But please, please don't leave here lost. Don't leave here unsaved. Today's the day of salvation. You have a glorious opportunity right now to be saved.